May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be accepted in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I want to congratulate you for navigating the time change this morning to spring forward to be here, even though it feels a little earlier. How many of you here have been to Carlsbad Caverns? Wow. Wow, it was the same at the 8 o'clock service as well. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the jewels of New Mexico. And so when we have uh, out-of-state, out-of-country visitors, we often will take them down to, to Carlsbad Caverns. And uh, my niece came out several years ago from Pennsylvania, and we took her down. Amazing trip. We went to the big room, and then from there we went to one of the smaller caves, and it must have been, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. It seemed like a long time, but it was narrow, and it wasn't really for uh, folks who would get claustrophobic, okay? <laughs> and we eventually got to this cave, and we all had those little miner's hats on. We were uh, listening to the park ranger talk, and then he said, shut off the lights. And we did. You could not see the, your, your hand in front of your face. It was so dark. And what he said as he was speaking was that no natural light will ever and can never enter that space. And then what he did was he just turned on one small light and it was incredible how it just illuminated the entire space. It was a big cave. It was incredible what that one light produced as we move from darkness into light. Scripture teaches how God has brought light into the darkness that humanity has caused. That light is Jesus Christ who has come into the world on a rescue mission for humanity. The world didn't realize how desperate the world was but God did and God did something about it in this passage from John chapter 3 we see Jesus with Nicodemus and how Jesus gives Nicodemus and gives us necessary information on God's rescue mission necessary information on God's rescue mission we're looking at this familiar passage with one of the most familiar verses in Scripture in John chapter 3. Well, first of all, what we notice about this encounter between Nicodemus and Jesus is how Jesus shifts the conversation to the necessary. Jesus shifts the conversation to the necessary. Nicodemus came with a idea of a conversation and perhaps how it would unfold but he began with pleasantries Jesus is there and Nicodemus comes to meet him at night and verse 1 says now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews so just in that one verse we, we learned a few things well first of all the name, Nicodemus, okay. A man of the Pharisees. So that tells us something about his religious upbringing and also his religious orientation. Here was a, a man who lived by a code of rules and regulations originally derived from Scripture, but in time had come to encompass 613 regulations and ordinances involving all aspects of life. How you ate, how you washed dishes, how you greeted people, all aspects of life were governed by these customs that had arisen over centuries. And not only was Nicodemus connected to those practices, it says that he was a ruler, that he was a leader, he was like a professor, a PhD, someone who's teaching others about the rules. And, you know, as a person who is in charge, he probably didn't mind pointing out where people fell short, 
where people weren't doing what they were supposed to do. That's what we learn about Nicodemus here. And he came to Jesus, verse 2, by night. Was he a little apprehensive of other colleagues seeing him, meeting with Jesus? Already, Jesus had a reputation, and in some circles, he had notoriety. God was doing something. What exactly was going on? That's what Nicodemus was there to find out. And under the cover of night, he meets with Jesus. And he begins in a rather pleasant way, doesn't he? He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Simple enough opening. And perhaps Nicodemus thinks that this is the entryway of polite conversation. Maybe they'll go to the Jerusalem Starbucks for a latte or something afterwards and, and kind of you know, talk what theologians and re religious professors like to talk about. But we see how Jesus shifts the conversation to the necessary. Verse 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't really see what God is doing unless you have this spiritual birth. And seeing is often connected to knowing in Scripture. You can't know what God is doing unless you have this spiritual birth. I mean, talk about a shift in the conversation from pleasantries to a place where Nicodemus is going, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? How, can this, this, how is this possible? And what does Jesus do? He, he presses in. Verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Not only can't he see it, can he know it, he can't even enter it. And just think about who Jesus is talking to here. Here is a man, Nicodemus, who had his identity as a godly man because, first of all, he was born into the family of God, the people of God, the chosen people. He was one of them, of course. He was born an Israelite. He was born a member of God's family. But secondly, and he probably would have put more emphasis on this, he has led a righteous and perfect life. He's done everything, so he thinks, that is commanded in the laws and regulations. He's lived a righteous life and he's working at it every single day to live according to this code, this way of life. How can Jesus then say that that works and this works righteousness is immaterial to your standing in God's kingdom? You can't even enter it. And he's saying it's a spiritual way of entry. It's not by your works. It's through God working by his spirit. How is that possible? Jesus goes on, shifting the conversation. In verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Jesus is unpacking what it means, the spiritual birth being connected with the Holy Spirit. And the spiritual birth can be said to be many things, but one thing it isn't. It's not humanly derived. It's not a part of a human program to determine who is a member of, of God's kingdom. It, it's uh, done through the Holy Spirit. And it seems kind of random from this description, doesn't it? The choice of whom is born again appears uncontrolled as the movement of the wind. It's not dictated. It's not determined. This birth is not determined 
by birth or rule-keeping or following practices handed down from ancestors, Nicodemus has never had a conversation like this because Jesus has shifted it from pleasantries to a place of importance and necessity. That's why Nicodemus says in verse 9, how can these things be? How is this possible? He's bewildered by what Jesus has just said. But wait, there's more. There's more. Because Jesus provides necessary information on God's rescue mission for humanity. He provides necessary information on God's rescue mission for humanity. And this rescue mission is necessary and it's urgent. This mission is a matter of life and death. Jesus answered in verse 10, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe it if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus pays Nicodemus a compliment. You are Israel's teacher. You're the brightest scholar around. You got straight A's and you aced your dissertation at Harvard. That's the caliber of person here, okay? You don't understand these things. You're in the dark. But so is everyone. And now Jesus has come to enlighten Nicodemus and everyone as to the purpose of the mission of God. Verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. What Jesus is saying is only one authority who has come from heaven, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. But not only is he the sole teacher who has come from heaven to give us the purposes of God and the purposes of the Messiah, he's also the one, the only one to institute what, Je what he has just said, what he's just said. Because Jesus provides the way to enter the kingdom of God by faith in him. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What Jesus is referring to is imagery that would have been very familiar to Nicodemus. Incident in the desert, in the wilderness, as the Israelites are going from Egypt to the promised land. They were in the wilderness. And what was their attitude about being in the wilderness? Were they happy campers? They, hey, this is great. Thank you so much, God. And Moses, we love you guys. Yeah, this is fantastic. We trust you. Everything. <laughs> right? Not so much. No, they're, they're pretty grumpy. They're, they're not happy campers, are they? And the passage that Jesus is referring to is Numbers chapter 21. The Israelites traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way and they spoke out against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake. And put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. He looked at the bronze snake and lived. So Jesus takes this familiar picture from the Old Testament and makes this change. So must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And what Jesus means by that is this, 
There's something worse than a snake bite. There's something worse than the coronavirus. What's worse is sin. What's worse is the consequence of sin that we may be snake bitten and given an antidote and live. But everyone is bitten by sin and the result of which everyone is destined to die spiritually. Everyone is destined to die because of sin. But Jesus Christ has come to do something about that. Jesus Christ has come to do something that no one else and nothing else could do. No amount of work and trying to be acceptable before God can do anything about the indwelling power and problem of sin until Jesus Christ himself came to do something about it. So that everyone who looks upon the Son of Man who is lifted high upon the cross will look at him and whoever believes in him, who has faith in him, may have eternal life. That's the reality that Jesus is describing to Nicodemus and that will come into effect by his crucifixion. And then, oddly, our insert that we got from the Anglican Church in North America leaves out verse 16, which is, well, I guess they just figured everybody knows it. Why even print it? Why save the, you know, spare the, you know, have, waste the ink on and printing it when, it when everyone knows, well, a lot of people know, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What Nicodemus and we discover is that we can't earn acceptability with God. We aren't born into God's kingdom. You may be born into a religious church-going family, you may do all the right things, but those right things in themselves doesn't automatically mean that you're in God's family. It doesn't mean that you're going to heaven. You can't earn your way into God's good graces. God doesn't owe you anything. The only way into God's kingdom comes from receiving the gracious gift of God for you and for me, Jesus Christ. Because God so loved the world, he gave us Jesus. Through receiving Jesus by faith, by receiving what he did on the cross for you, the finished work of Christ, you have his gift of eternal life. Instead of perishing, we have the gift of eternal life. In this life, by looking to Christ in faith, we can have certainty. Not because we're certain of our certainty, but because we're certain of the character of Jesus Christ and the one who's making these promises to us in this passage and in so many others in Scripture. We can trust him and have certainty in him that through him and by believing in him we have the gift of eternal life. This is the necessary information that Jesus shares with Nicodemus and us about God's rescue mission. We don't realize how bleak our prospects are until A, God points them out and B, Jesus shows us what he has come to do about the besetting problem of sin for us by dying on the cross for us. We learn from Jesus of the necessary information on God's rescue mission. Nicodemus was in the dark in a spiritual Carlsbad cavern until the light of the world comes. I kind of feel for Nicodemus. He came because he was curious. He wanted a little information from Jesus and what was going on with him and with John the Baptist, but he got a lot more than he was expecting. He received information on God's rescue mission. This Lent may be a time when you're kind of feeling in the dark, a little uncertain, you're discouraged. 
You're uncertain about what's been going on in your life. The coronavirus has made you uneasy. Your finances are going through a tough time. Your health or the health of a loved one is not the best. There are a number of things hitting you all at once. But there is hope in the rescuer who came to save you, Jesus Christ. Jesus shifts the internal conversation that we can be on sometimes. Sometimes we get on a pessimistic train of thought like it's like a, a, a hamster wheel and just kind of go around and around and around and you just can't seem to break out of that cycle of just one bad thing after another and another and another and another. And it can leave us being in a dark place. Jesus has come to shed light on our situation to reveal to us that he is with us in the midst of our circumstances because he came to die for us, to be with us, and so that we can be with him forever. We can know the certainty of his care and his love today. Jesus came to give you and me life like his, eternal life, not life consumed by dealing with one thing after another, but life that has assurance and confidence to overcome with him and with our friends in the church. We're never good enough for God. We can't earn our way into heaven and into God's good books. But we're given a place in his kingdom because of the gift of Jesus that we can receive and we can know in this life. His peace and presence come as gifts because of his great love for us and all in his family. May this Lent be one of greater certainty of the light that has come into our dark world. That Jesus came to rescue us for eternity and to rescue us during our day as we go through our various trials and issues and challenges is that Jesus is with us in the midst of those. And may we recall this Lent of the great gift that he is and he has given us to be made members of his family through spiritual birth forever. Amen.